Today we're in Matthew 12. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13. And what we're looking at, just to take from the passage, is that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so by way of introduction, let me say to you that this study that we have is going to be laden with introductory remarks and context so that you can see uh, the reason that Jesus is going to respond in the way that he does in these verses. And so as we begin, I'm going to be laying down some things for you so that you're going to be seeing, I believe, more clearly what the essence of the conversation and dispute really is. Because in order to understand why there is a big deal taking place in these verses, you'd need to know the background as to why they would be questioning him in the way that they are. And so I say that by way of introduction. Let's begin reading together here in Matthew chapter 12. I'll begin by reading verses 1 through 8 and get into our study. I will pick up at verse 9 and conclude with verse 13. So beginning at verse 1, Matthew chapter 12, reading to verse 8. Matthew writes, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Then he said to them, Shut up! No. <laughs> then he said to them, Have you not read what Jesus, rather what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests of the temple produce in the temple profane? I'll say that again. Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even on the Sabbath. So what we have here as we introduce Matthew chapter 12 is two controversies. These two controversies are encapsulated in verses 1 through 13, and both of them relate to the Sabbath. These controversies are actually going to illustrate for us uh, about something that, that, that we call legalism. Now, legalism is a word that many of you have grown to understand. Many of you are believers and thus have heard the term legalism uh, most of your Christian life. You've heard the term legalism and you understand what it's speaking about. But perhaps some of you have really never really understood what that word means or ever heard a definition concerning legalism. So let me give to you, as we begin our study, let me give to you a definition of legalism because what we're dealing with in verses 1 through 13 are two instances of legalism that are being questioned and brought, an answer is being brought forth by Jesus regarding the, uh, the issue of legalism. So legalism is the act of putting law above gospel by establishing requirements for salvation beyond repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and reducing the precepts of the Bible to narrow and rigid moral codes. It is the emphasizing of the letter of the law at the expense of the spirit of the law. Legalism brings you under strict rules of behavior that are intended to save you, when in reality it results in bondage and undermines the compassion, mercy, and grace of God in salvation. You see, during Jesus' day, prominent religious leaders had established rules that were to guide believers. And their intent was to take the commandments of God and to make them practical in your daily life. In their attempt to do so, they actually began to close the door of salvation to people. And Jesus, especially in Matthew 23, but in other places also, addressed the fruit of legalism. And he did so with a strong rebuke because of what happened when people got into bondage of the legalistic practices of the religious leaders of his day. In Matthew, for example, chapter 23, verse 13, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. 
for you neither go in yourselves nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Your rules and your regulations are closing the door of heaven. You're not going to heaven, and your rules and regulations prohibit those who would desire to go in from ever entering in themselves. You see, instead of directing people to live by faith and love, they produced a system that relied on good works. And Jesus spoke harshly. He spoke harshly of this on many occasions. He actually gave scathing rebukes for those who practiced such teaching and gave such teaching. In Matthew 15, he said, verses 7, and 7 through 9, once again, he said, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And so Jesus was the one person in history who was capable of looking at people and saying, You're a hypocrite, and this is the reason why you are. He, he dealt with that attitude throughout his entire ministry. He had a lot to say about it because the religious teachings of these people had the effect of making faith into just an outward show. You know, I don't drink and I don't chew and I don't go with girls that do, that kind of thing. So it was all outward appearances. He says in Matthew 23, verse 5, all their works they, they do to be seen by men. And so it was all religious outside appearances. So they would fast and they would pray and they would give generously, but they did that to gain attention. And Jesus spoke concerning about that, concerning that. The religious authorities created a system and the system that they created kept people in bondage. He said in Matthew 23, verse four, they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They were so strict that they created rules that guided almost all moral behavior in life. Again, in Matthew 23, he said in verses 23 and 24, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Now, Jesus had just invited people to do something. We saw that in chapter 11. He had just invited people to take his yoke upon them. He had said that his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and he said if you take that upon yourself, you will find rest for your souls. But the legalism of his day made following God a burden instead of a joy. You know, your, your walk with the Lord it shouldn't be burdensome to you. The commandments of God, John tells us, are not burdensome. They're not hard to bear. Uh, God's word, the entrance of his word provides light. His commandments are a joy to us. And, and rather than, than us chafing against it, getting upset about it, uh, that God has said, do this and don't do that, the idea of having fellowship with God is really something that produces joy within us. It's like what it says in Psalm 122, verse 1, where the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It was a matter of, I'm glad when they said, let us go. I want to rejoice and bring praise and, and worship to God. It's not a burden. It's not a bummer. You know, I don't want to stay and sleep in and whatever. I don't want to avoid fellowship. I want to be there. I want to be there with God's people. I want to worship God. It's a joy. It's a joy to follow after Jesus Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is love and, and joy. It's peace and long-suffering. And it's, it's all of those things that you desire to have that are given to you freely by Christ through faith in Him. So I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It wasn't a bummer. It wasn't like, oh, you know, I don't want to go. Like that guy who was in bed and, and his wife came and said to him, honey, get up, it's time for church. And he said, I don't want to go. You know, I can stay in, in bed today. No, it's time to go to church. Get up. No, I'm not. No, I'm going to stay in bed. I don't want to go. Get up, honey. It's time to go to church. I don't want to go to church. Why not? They're mean to me there. They gossip about me. They're so unkind. I don't want to go to church. Give me a good reason to go to church. I don't want to go to church. Well, one, I'll give you two. One, it's Sunday. We go to church. Two, you're the pastor. You have to go. <laughs> You know, sometimes people don't want to go. You know, but it's, it's not a burden. It's a joy. It's, it's a place where God meets us in a special way. 
It, like it says in Psalm 63, verses 2 through 4, I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands unto your name. We used to sing that, thy loving kindness is better than life. We used to sing that when I first got saved. These psalms were made into music of, of our period, and we would sing thy loving kindness and all because, you know, I will lift up my hands into thy name. My lips shall praise thee. Why? Because we get to see your power and we get to see your glory. Your loving kindness is better than life. And that should cause us to want to be in the sanctuary of the Lord, serving and worshiping God with God's people. There's a joy to it. But... In legalism, the service to God and the worship of God simply becomes a burden, and that's what was happening here. So in this chapter, Jesus deals with legalism that had developed relating to what is called the keeping of the Sabbath. You see, certain Jewish religious leaders had developed regulations that related to this day called the Sabbath day. And the result was that the people didn't understand the spiritual purpose of keeping Shabbat or keeping the Sabbath. You see, keeping the Sabbath was especially important during the time of Christ and remains to this day to those that are referred to as observant Jews. You see, the Sabbath was real important. Somebody says, well, what is the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath is that time that is set apart for the worship of God. And, and an observant Jew would note that, that God himself had taken the seventh day and rested when he had finished creation. You see that in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, in chapter 2, in verses 1 and 2, where it says, Thus the heavens and the earth, and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. So when the Bible there in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 2, says he rested on the seventh day, Somebody will say, well, see, God got tired. That means that God is not omnipotent or all-powerful because if the Bible says he rested, it must mean that he became fatigued or tired. The word rested there literally speaks of ceasing from work. It doesn't mean that God was physically tired. The Bible makes it very clear that God doesn't get physically tired. In Isaiah 40, verse 28, it reads, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He is not fatigued, nor does he become tired. The reason the Bible speaks of God resting is simply because he had completed his work. So in the law, when the law was given to the nation of Israel through Moses, the Sabbath, or the seventh day, was established by God and was given to the nation of Israel as a day of rest. You see it in the law in Exodus chapter 20, for example, verses 8 through 11, where the commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger, who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the Sabbath day was a day that they were to reflect, to meditate, to study, to pray, and even fast. It was a day to think of God. When I was a little boy and I was going to religious school on Saturdays, they taught us the Ten Commandments, and they said, you are to do no work on on Sunday. And I can still remember my dad and me out in the backyard when he said to me, son, I've raked up the leaves, but you need to throw them in the trash can. And I said, I'm sorry, dad, but I cannot. <laughs> I was eight years old. It's a true story. True story. I'm sorry, dad, I cannot. What do you mean you can't? I just told you to pick up the leaves and throw them inside that, that barrel there. And I said, I'm sorry, father, I cannot. Why not? Because the Lord said, I am to rest and the Sabbath. And today is a day of rest. And you know what? My dad didn't make me pick up those leaves. He didn't. I got over on him for some time with that one <laughs> commandment. 
Well, was that what it was set up? So you could refuse and dishonor your father by not obeying a command to help him clean up the yard? No, it was a day that you had to set, a, uh, set apart to meditate on the things of God, to pray uh, somewhat fast. It was a day where, where God was to be exalted and you were to spend time uh, reflecting on him. You see, over the centuries, the Jewish religious leaders recognized the Sabbath to be extremely important. And eventually what happened is they added their traditions to the biblical regulations related to it. They have what is called the Talmud. It's the oral law that's committed to writing. And the Talmud has 24 chapters that list Sabbath laws. 24 chapters that list Sabbath laws. All work was forbidden, including any kind of work imaginable. So if you looked into the Talmud, you would see that tailors did not carry a needle for fear that they might be tempted to sew. Clothing could not be washed or dyed. Fires could not be lit or extinguished. Baths could not be taken for fear water would fall on the floor and wash it. You could not carry anything heavier than a dried fig. Chairs could not be moved because dragging them might make a furrow in the ground. Women did not look into mirrors for fear of breaking it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're listening. You are listening, good. <laughs> Women did not look into mirrors in the event that they might see a gray hair and pluck it out. False teeth could not be worn because they exceeded the weight limit you were allowed to carry. Page after page after page after page of regulations related to Shabbat. So the Sabbath became a time of frustration and stress. And the people were tired of bearing this ungodly yoke of man-made oppressive regulations. So that gives us insight into what is taking place in this passage. You see, in the work that you see Jesus perform in verses 1 through 13, um, it would appear to those who were very scrupulous in their observation of the Sabbath that he was simply a Sabbath breaker who was also teaching his men to do the same. And so it looks very obvious that he's breaking their traditional law, and that angers them. So when we look at verses 1 through 8, those verses are concerned with physical labor that is being performed on the Sabbath. When we do look at verses 9 through 14, those verses are concerned with the fact that Jesus performed a healing on the Sabbath. Now, I'll give you a little bit more context. By this time, Jesus has already alienated the religious leaders of his day. They've already been making accusations. We've seen them here in the Gospel of Matthew. They've accused him of blasphemy because he forgave a man's sins. We saw that in Matthew chapter 9, verse 3, when Jesus had forgiven a man of his sins, and, and they said amongst themselves, uh, this man blasphemes because he had forgiven him of sins. We saw him being accused of living an unholy life in Matthew chapter 9, verse 11, when the question is asked, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And then they accused him of being empowered by Satan himself in Matthew 9, 34, where the Pharisees said he cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. And so Jesus is already dealing with accusations that are being lodged against him. And now we see very clearly that the religious leaders are searching for scriptural reasons to reject him. Now he's already been addressing their attitude. They have an attitude of criticism as well as indifference. He's already addressed that. But they were determined, they were determined to reject Jesus Christ. And the Bible makes it very clear that that was their mindset. I mean, when John was introducing the gospel of John, he made it clear in John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, that they were intent on rejecting him. He says there that he, speaking of Jesus, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. They didn't welcome him. They didn't accept him. They didn't want him. And again, one of the primary causes for opposition related to the observance of the Sabbath. It appears that Jesus does not honor the Sabbath. This is causing them tremendous problems. And so that's what we see here in Matthew chapter 12. And in verses 1 through 8, it speaks concerning a controversy over Sabbath labor. Now in verses 1 and 2, 
At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples are hungry, began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And so this particular chapter, these things that are taking place, occur shortly after the events recorded in chapter 11. And Matthew makes it clear that Jesus and his men are walking through grain fields. And as they're walking through fields of grain, his disciples are hungry and they begin to take the, the grain and they begin to, to eat it. Somebody says, well, was Jesus allowing them to steal because they don't own those grain fields and yet they're going through the fields and they're taking things and they're eating. Are they stealing? And the answer would be no. Even today, if you have a neighbor who has a fruit tree and uh, the fruit tree, one of the branches of the fruit tree comes into your side of the property, you are within your legal right, if you wanted to, to take that apple or that orange or that tangerine or whatever it may be. You have it within legal right to do that. You can do that. Well, during the time of Christ, it was within the confines of the, the law of Moses to be able to do that. So no, they were not breaking the law. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse 25, it says, when you come into the standing corn of your neighbor, you may pluck the ears with your hand. You may do that. It's, it's, it's permitted. In Leviticus 19, verse 10, it says, do not strip every last uh, bunch of grapes from the vines. Do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners who live among you, for I, the Lord, am your God. So that was completely permissible for them to do at that time. But the Pharisees, according to verse 2, see it, and they say, your disciples are doing what's not lawful. Luke gives us more insight because in chapter 6, verse 1 of his gospel, Luke says, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. His disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. And so the fact that he was, they were taking the grain and were rubbing it in the mind of the Pharisees, that is called threshing. And thus they were picking and threshing grain. And so the way that they thought, they thought they were threshing grain and that is unlawful. You're breaking Moses' law. So what, is, what this is really is their own religious tradition. And in their mind, their religious tradition is equal to God's declared word. And so in, in essence, what they're saying is this. They're saying, your disciples have broken our regulations. Now, when they say that, notice Jesus' response in verses 3 and 4. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Two things that I want to bring out in this. One, you need to know who he's speaking to. <clears throat> Jesus, and look at the way he, he brings it up. I want you to see this in verse 3. Have you not read? For us today in the 21st century, that doesn't mean anything. But if you put it in its historic context, it means a tremendous amount. And I'll tell you what it means. When Jesus is speaking to these Pharisees, when he's speaking to these experts of the law, in essence, what he is saying to them is you are without knowledge. He is saying to them, you are ignorant of God's word. And that, you have to understand, to them would have been an amazing rebuke because they made their life to know the word. They would search the scriptures, Jesus says in John 5, for in it he said, you think that you have eternal life and these are they which speak concerning me. He said to them, you search the scriptures, the word search, Literally, and every police officer in this place will understand this, you ransack. You ransack. It's not just a searching as if I'm just observing casually. No, it's like when somebody breaks into somebody's house and they ransack the house. All the cushions are removed, all the mattresses are pulled off, all the, the drawers are opened and dropped on the ground. They're ransacking. If you ever read that somebody ransacked a house, that's what took place. They turned it upside down, is what he's saying. And he said, you search the scriptures for in them, you think you have eternal life. You ransack the Bible, and these are they which speak of me. You're missing me in your ransacking. That's the point he's making. 
And so when he says, have you not read, that's a tremendous slam on these people because he's in essence saying, you're ignorant of the word of God. You haven't studied in the way that this whole population thinks that you're experts on word and, and experts on God. He's saying, you're not, you have not read. And so he rebukes them, and that's a strong word of rebuke. They're saying, your disciples have broken our resurrections. But Jesus says, basically, you're ignorant of God's word. You see, rather than arguing about their religious traditions, what does Jesus do? He takes them right to the word of God. You see, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Bible says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If there's a word of correction that is coming, it comes through the word. And that's why Jesus draws their attention to what David did with his men. Now, they're very familiar with what he's speaking about when he says in verse 3, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who are with him, but only for the priests. And so he brings up a historic reference to them that they would be familiar with because when David, king, David who, was, who was fleeing at that time, who became King David, when he was fleeing at that time from a man by the name of King Saul, Saul was going to kill him, and thus David and some of his men escaped from Saul and fled. They fled to a city called the city of Nob. The city of Nob is where the tabernacle, the uh, portable tent that God had given to Israel until the temple itself was built, they fled to this particular city where the priests were and the tabernacle was, and they, on their way there, fleeing from, from uh, Saul, when they arrived there, had no food. So David goes in and he says, I need some food. You need to give us something to eat. And there was a discussion between David and the priest, and the priest said, you can't have this. It's dedicated to, to the priest. This is the bread of the presence. The word showbread is also the, the bread of the presence. There were 12 loaves that were baked, and they were to represent the 12 tribes of Israel before God. And in the Jewish regulation and ritual, only the priests had the right to eat that showbread. But David comes in and he says, do you have anything for us? We're starving, we're very hungry. And, and all, and they ended up eating this showbread. But that was against what, what the law would have said. In Exodus 29, verse 32, it says, At the entrance of the tent of meeting, or the tabernacle, Aaron and his sons are to eat the meat of the ram and the bread that is in the basket. They are to eat these offerings by which atonement was made for their ordination and consecration, but no one else may eat them because they are sacred. And yet Jesus is referring to the fact that because the human need was great, that it was permissible to meet human needs. The second thing he speaks about in verse 5 pertains to the thought that priests actually work on the Sabbath. He says in verse 5, Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? And so the priests worked. They performed various duties. They would light the altar fires. They would kill and offer sacrifices, perform circumcisions. There's a variety of things that they would do. And uh, they were guiltless because they were performing the proper things that should be occurring on that day. So the point he's making is very basic. God allowed this ceremonial law to be violated for David that he might be fed because human need is more important than man-made regulations. When he continues on, he makes the point here in verse 6 to say this, but I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He is Lord even of the Sabbath. A couple of other things. When he says in verse 6, I say unto you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. You need to understand how they would have responded to that statement. You see, the temple symbolizes the presence of God with his people. In 1 Kings, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, Solomon 
who built the temple. Solomon finished the building of the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had achieved all he had desired to do. The Lord appeared to him a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. So when Jesus Christ is saying, in this place there is one greater than the temple, he is saying something that is incredibly powerful. He is saying he is God because nothing besides God himself is greater than the temple. So he's saying you are missing the entire point of the Sabbath. It wasn't simply established to regulate works that people performed and thus in a Staining from certain works and doing others makes you right with God. The Sabbath was a place of meditation. The pla uh, it was a day of meditation, of worship of God, of service to the Lord. And you're missing the fact that to have Jesus Christ is to have fellowship. You see, when he says, if you'd known in verse 7 what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Why? The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath because it's all about Jesus Christ. It's fulfilled in him. Now with that said, we have a second controversy, verse nine. When he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. They asked him saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That they might accuse him. Then he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored as whole as the other. So according to Mark in chapter three, verse two, he's there in the synagogue and they watched him closely whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. So they attempt to set him up and they're asking him a leading question. And the question is, is it lawful to heal? Now, you need to understand that during the day of Christ, they believed that physical healing in this fashion would have been considered working. That scene when, when, when Jesus was in a synagogue and, and he healed a woman with a spirit of infirmity, demonized, she had been bent over for 18 years and, and Jesus had entered in, it was the Sabbath, he had delivered her, she was healed, and according to Luke 13, verse 14, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. And so they were very strong about that, and they thought that healing was working. So he's dealing again with a different kind of expression of legalism. So he asked a question, verses 11 and 12. He said, if you have a sheep and it falls into a pit, will you not take it out even if it's the Sabbath? If you own an animal, you do all you can to keep it from pain. If it falls into a pit, you rescue it, and you do it because of your compassion, even though it's just an animal. Proverbs 12.10 says a righteous man regards the life of his animal. And so somebody who cares about animals very often is showing kind of compassion that you ought to show. So you'd show compassion for your sheep that's in a pit, but you're upset because I set somebody free who had a, an infirmity. That again is the fruit of legalism. When your legalistic compassion for hurting people isn't practiced, keeping rules is all that matters. Let me give you a couple thoughts about legalism because that's really the heart of what we're looking at today. One of the things I want to remind you of is that legalism will always be the enemy of God's grace. It always is. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law? or by believing what you heard. Are you so foolish 
After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? You were saved by grace. And are you going to make yourself better now on your own? A lot of people think that you get saved and from that point on, you're responsible for how you live to the degree that if I live well, God will honor me. If I don't live well, then I'm not going to heaven. And we actually, though we're saved by grace, we try to keep ourselves by our human works, and it doesn't work that way at all. The bottom line is, is that I am in terrible need of Christ's grace in every element of my life, every moment that I exist. I need his help all the time, not just when I got saved. I need it every morning when I wake up and every waking moment that, that goes through that day, and then even while I'm asleep, he keeps me. I need his grace. So do you. And what happens is sometimes we get saved by grace and then we begin to live by works. And that's why Paul would say, were, were, you, were you saved by grace through belief in Christ and receive the power of the Spirit, but now you're going to make yourself perfect? Or don't you understand that every element of your life is an element of grace? We are saved by God's grace. And we live by God's grace. Now somebody... Let me, let me backtrack a moment and say this. Somebody asks a question, now wait a minute, but we're talking about the Sabbath, and you didn't answer a question that I have. The question that I have is how come we meet on Sunday and not on Saturday? I don't know, let's keep going. No, um, somebody might ask that. I've had that question before, so let me answer it very briefly and then I'll move on to what I was saying and continue. Very important. Um, years ago, Years ago now, 20 plus years ago, I was teaching like I am right now, but in, in the other um, sanctuary that we have, the chapel, we call the chapel now. And I gave a study and a, a woman approached me after the service and I still remember the conversation. She said to me, this is my first service I've attended here and, and the Lord has placed something on my heart that I believe that you, you need to hear. And I said, what is it that he has laid on your heart for me? She says, the Lord is saying that if you, that the Lord is saying that he is blessing you, but that if you were to start having services on Saturday rather than Sunday, he would bless you even more abundantly. So I said, no, God isn't saying that to me. You are. Because the Bible doesn't teach that. Now, there are those who would say, well, wait a minute. How come the church meets on Sunday? We're here on Sunday and we've been looking at Sabbath, and it seems to me that uh, Sabbath is when we're supposed to be meeting. Well, we need to remember that the uh, Sabbath is established for the nation of Israel, not the church. In Exodus 31, 16, it reads in the Old Testament, therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. The Sabbath meeting on the seventh day, which they hold to be on Saturday, basically, just to just minimize that from sundown on Friday into sunset on, on Saturday is the Shabbat. Um, it, it's a perpetual ordinance for the nation of Israel. The church meets on Sundays traditionally because it is the first day of the week and it's when Jesus Christ arose from the dead which celebrates, we celebrate that he was the fulfillment of the law, took it upon himself. If you go into the New Testament, there is what's called the Decalogue, the Ten Words, which we also refer to as the Ten Commands, or the Ten Commandments. In the New Testament, nine of those commands are repeated. Only one is not repeated for the church, and that is the Sabbath day. That is not found in the New Testament. Nine of the ten are, but keeping the Sabbath day is not. Now, there are those who will say, you, and I could name them, I won't, I don't feel like doing it right now, but there are organizations that will say that we who meet on, on, on Sundays are actually bearers of the mark of the beast, but the fact is, is we celebrate the resurrection of Christ on Sunday because the church has always done that as well as the fact it's just an awareness that we have, we have come to honor the Savior who fulfilled every element on our behalf that we might have a relationship with God uh, through him. 
We are saved by grace. And because we are saved by grace, we should not be in the bondage of the do's and the don'ts that people sometimes will put on you. There, I've mentioned this to you. Some of you have heard me say this perhaps even more than once. But when I first got saved, I'll give you an illustration. When I first got saved, being a hippie, I had the longer hair. I didn't wear shoes and all of that. And, um, and now I come to faith in Christ. And I didn't have a single person telling me at that time, put shoes on your feet. You might find this interesting. Perhaps you will. Even when I first began this fellowship and I was having Sunday mornings in a house, I have always worn sandals. This is where I wear shoes. Here. I've always worn sandals and all. And, uh, and I would kick my sandals off when I would teach Sunday morning because I was in a front room and I was teaching a Bible study and without thinking about it, I would take my sandals off. My mom said to me, son, I don't like looking at your feet. Keep your shoes on. And that's how I started wearing shoes for Bible studies. I mean, for the longest time, Marie can tell you, I mean, the minute I come home, there's a corner where I kick my shoes off, and that's where they stay until I have to go outside. That's that way. I'm just an old hippie. I've never repented from that. So when I get saved, I have the long hair and all of that, and people are uptight. And there was this one church that I could name, which I won't. There was one church out of state that... that would give invitations, they would always give their invitations, and when a, a hippie kid would come forward, they would come forward, they would pray with them, and then they would take them for follow-up, and there was a barber on staff. So this is the truth, there was a barber on staff who would give them a haircut, because everybody knows that Jesus had a close-cut haircut when he was walking on the face of the earth. That's what we do, and we haven't changed. We have, there, there are, st I've had people angry at me, and, and I'm not saying this so that you'll say, oh, poor David, you, you probably don't care, but I've had people angry at me because we don't have certain things. Where's the Hammond organ? Where's the stained glass? Where's all the accoutrements of what I, I believe is traditional for real worship of Christ? Where are the certain hymns that I grew up with? And one thing after another. And what happens is we get caught up with appearance and what makes us feel comfortable. So you go into a bookstore, and one of the people, which we've had uh, people working in our bookstore with tattoos, and before you know it, I have people say, oh, I can't buy a book in there, because they got tattoos in there. And then you've got the piercings and stuff. Now listen, you know, the piercings, I don't get it. I mean, I'm not going to pretend that I do. I don't get it. Those things got to hurt, and especially in the belly button. And if you have them long enough, you won't see those piercings anyway, because something's going to hide them. And then you may want to go out there and you might want to put that hummingbird on your lower back. But ladies, remember, it grows into a vulture. <laughs> I mean, but that's up to you, man. And then you're walking, it's flying. Okay, keep that in mind. <laughs> we get caught up. If you don't do it the way I do it, then you must not be saved. If you don't like my music, you must not be saved. If you don't have service in a certain order, you must not be saved. If you look in a certain way, you must not be saved. And you want to know what that is? That's just old-fashioned legalism where we, where we take the flesh and we bring it in because we have certain comfort levels and we think everybody's supposed to live under the laws that we have found ourselves to be under. We have to be very careful with that kind of mentality. There are people who get mad at people for playing cards. They get mad at them because they actually dance. They, they get mad at them because of the style of worship music that's in the church. They, they will say something about them going to a movie or, or liking certain secular songs. They can get mad about the length of a person's hair or, or how to dress in church because there are people who say, you, ladies, you need to wear dresses. You can't come in in pantsuits or jeans. Of course not, you know. They get mad because a lady wears jewelry. They'll even get so mad that because a woman is wearing makeup. I appreciate makeup. <laughs> it's a good thing, as long as the men aren't wearing it. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm good with that. But what it is, is we, we end up finding things that are really in the confines of our own hearts, and then we say, this is what God is pleased with, and that's what Jesus dealt with. They're saying, they're threshing wheat, on the Sabbath, you're breaking the law. No, we're not. 
they're permitted to do that. You actually healed a man, a man with a withered hand who was there in synagogue in worship services, getting taught, you, how dare you do a work on the, on the Sabbath? Six days are given for us for work to be done, not the seventh. This, you should have left him in bondage and you should have left him crippled because that would have satisfied us. I've been asked, uh, even this morning, Pastor, what would you do if, if, if somebody came in who was very obviously, this is a question, I'm not making this question up, this was this morning in between service and I was asked a question. Pastor, what would you do if a, a lady came in and she was dressed in the traditional um, dress of a Muslim, what would you do? And I said, what would I do? I would welcome her, why wouldn't I? I want her to hear about Jesus Christ, of course. That's what you do, that's what you do. We're here to proclaim the love of Christ. Of course. You know, it's, it, 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 and she said, I thought so, Pastor. I said, well, yes, mm -hmm. of course, that's what we do. But there are those that say, oh, no. And, and that's the whole problem that we're having. There's so many issues that people are debating, and they're not the more important ones. Now, listen, it isn't legalistic to be obedient to God's word. You're not legalistic when you're seeking the grace of God to live a Christ-honoring life. You read the word, it says, this is what I want from you, and these things you ought not to do. We just need to obey the law by the spirit of grace and the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And, and, and much of what's going on today that I think is, is um, living sinful lives is, is because sometimes people just aren't getting taught the word, and thus they don't know. I, I had a young woman come and speak to me many years ago now, and she said to me, that she and her boyfriend needed some counseling and it was after a Sunday service. I set up some time. She didn't go to our church. I set up some time to, to meet with her and she showed up. It was this young lady and I said, I thought I was supposed to meet with you and your boyfriend. She said, he didn't want to come. I said, well, where is he? And she said, oh, he's just down the street. He's at the park. He's playing football with some of his friends. I said, your boyfriend didn't want to come today? She said, no. And I said, but you came anyway? And she said, yes. I said, how can I help you? So she began to speak to me and said to me things like this. She said, you know, my relationship with him isn't going so well and we're having difficulties and I, we just need some couple counseling. And so as I began to speak to her, I asked her some basic questions. I said, honey, are you a, are you a believer in Christ? And she said, yes. I said, is your boyfriend? She says, no, he's not. And, well, there's one problem. And now the boyfriend and girlfriend, and I said, okay. And then we, I said, what else are you going through? And she says, well, we've been sexually intimate. I said, so you're having sex with him? She said, yeah. So from there, an unbeliever, one thing, uh, uh, you know, in a sexual relationship without marriage is another thing. And I started giving her scripture. And as we did so, I said, honey, do you go to church anywhere? And she said, yes. And I said, and in your church, have you ever been taught what it means to be with an unbeliever? And she says, no, I haven't. I said, have you ever been taught what it means to live a sexually pure life? And she says, I've never heard. I said, the scripture I just read to you, have you ever heard that taught in your, in your study? And she says, no, I never have. I said, this is what God's word says, honey, and this is what you need to do. Make a very long story short, she prayed with me. She got right with the Lord. She went and she broke up with this young man, and then I didn't hear for her, from her for some time. About three years or so later, I received a letter, and in the letter it was this young lady, and she said, you may not remember me, but I remember you. She said, let me refresh your memory. I was the young lady who was in your office weeping about a bad relationship with a young man that I had been physically intimate with. She said, in that meeting, you shared with me that I should break off the relationship, get right with God, and pursue him. I never saw you again, but let me give you a follow-up. She says, I want you to know that I took your advice, that I went to a Christian college. I became the president of the Christian club. I met a great guy at that college. He and I are getting married in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I just wanted to let you know. And see, that's what happens. There are, there, are people, there are people who aren't reading the Bible, perhaps aren't being taught through the Word of God. They don't know what God's Word says, and so they're ignorantly in sin. But then there are others who say, this is how you're supposed to live. This is what you're supposed to do. And they have this harsh and, and this unloving attitude. And they're not showing the grace of God to them. You know, Jesus Christ came to set the captive free. And not only that, but I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice how it says in verse 13 that he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Now, wait a minute. I can't. 
I'm crippled. My hand is withered. I have an incapacity to do what you're saying. And yet I've discovered something. I've discovered that when God is present, even the impossible is able to be performed because he gives to you the ability to perform that which you can't without him. Stretch out your hand. And there are people today in this room that the Lord is saying, stretch out your hand. Stretch out your hand. God can set you free. God can heal every broken piece of your heart. God can minister to you effectively. It isn't the rules and it's not the regulations. It's the love of Christ and the compassion of Jesus Christ as he extends it to us. And these people would have just as soon had Jesus' disciples hungry and a, and a man with a, cripple, a crippled man, they would have just as soon he remained crippled in order for their rules and regulations to be followed. And Jesus wasn't about to do that. Jesus said, no, you stretch out your hand. And I know you're watching me, and I know that you're here to accuse me, but let me give you something to accuse me of. Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched out his hand, and it was made perfectly whole because Jesus Christ has come to give us strength to stretch out our hands to him. That's what God does. That is his grace. And now we know why we sing amazing grace. Because his grace is amazing, isn't it?